you for tuning in to the Tuesday edition of the Eau Claire County Megacast. I'm Ronnie Dahl here in the studios alongside Tyler Keith. Great to have you with us on this election day. One of the best things about today here in our area, the weather is so much nicer than it was um, like Sunday. Sunday, yeah. we had snow and it was crazy. Yesterday was windy. Today, though, it looks like the weather is much improved, so that's going to make it a little bit easier for everyone that is standing out in line to be able to vote today. I did uh, swing by the Kegel Harbor uh, office today where we vote there at City Hall, and there was a bit of a line outdoors. I always try to go at an off time on Election Day so I can try to avoid the lines, and I will say for the most part that's worked for me, Tyler. Yeah, it's worked for me in the past, too. I usually would, would go at an off time. Either I would take a lunch break or I would go out and, uh, and, and I would go at a later time after I'm done with the work, work day while everyone's starting to commute. So I'd be able to miss the lines, at least. Uh, you, even this morning, you mentioned Kiko Harbor. There was a, a bit of a wait uh, shortly after the polls opened in Sylvan Lake. Uh, their city clerk, Denise Dryden, had announced that there was about a 15-minute wait in line to vote at the community center so uh, people are definitely eager to vote in the p- vote at the polls vote in person today which of course is their right even during a pandemic people are still able to vote in person if they so choose and of course do so safely and, th- and people are definitely doing that today but these lines in our communities definitely a lot shorter than they are in some other major cities or will be in other major cities throughout the state of michigan and the u.s today uh so yeah a lot of people have already taken advantage of being able to vote absentee so we're pretty much already at a record level for voter turnout which i think that's one of the great things coming out of this election a lot of contention on both sides of the aisle but let's hope that it's a safe election day for everyone i know there's been a lot of talk about voter intimidation at the polls I did a little um, poll on one of my Facebook pages, and I will say so far everyone has said, no, they're not worried about it. It's never happened to them in the past. I will say I've never experienced that as well, but that's been kind of a a big debate going into this election. I know a lot of police departments are going to have extra officers out helping to watch the polls as well, but I think for the most part, especially here in the greater West Bloomfield area, that does not seem to be an issue for a lot of our voters. So let's hope it's a safe day. And the good thing, again, the weather is nice. And yes. the weather does impact voter turnout a lot of times. Mm-hmm. So um, that's good to know. A lot of other things still going on here in the uh, greater West Bloomfield area, as well as across the state of Michigan. The morning headlines, as we've been talking about and we told you about last week, the new mandate coming out of the health department requiring the uh, restaurants that now have to uh, provide names and phone numbers of their customers as part of a dining experience so that started yesterday if you go into a restaurant here in the state of michigan you are going to be required to provide your name as well as your phone number the mandate is intended to help limit the spread of COVID-19, but the lack of information from the state on how that information is to be collected has the restaurant industry calling for more details. Expectations for how to gather the information and what should be done with it are unclear. According to the CEO of the Michigan Restaurant and Lodging Association, uh, we're going to try to hopefully have him on a little bit later in the week to be able to talk more in depth about this issue. Also a concern is a restaurant owner's liability if the personal details provided to the restaurant are shared. Other questions include whether every person at the table must provide contact information, whether minors are included, and whether a restaurant faces a penalty if false or incomplete information is given. State Health Department says it is finalizing guidance for restaurants. Didn't say why that didn't happen before the rules took effect. And I will say, we've talked about this before with the state of Michigan, where they'll put these mandates in place, but it's like they don't think them through and allow for additional guidelines. One of the things I did is I looked at the actual uh, mandate coming out of the health department, and it says for people ordering food, It does not specify whether or not it's for people just ordering drinks as well. So there's a lot of confusion about this and what happens in so many of these different areas. So we'll be looking for some clarification on that. Confusing time to be 
uh, a restaurant owner here in the state of Michigan. Yeah, definitely. And it's an, it's another one of those situations, like you said, where some further clarification would have definitely been uh, invited by these restaurants from the state of Michigan. And I, I think part of it is you just want to get these orders in place because of the greater safety of the public. Then that's the whole reason for putting them in place. So if you put them in place quickly and they're not completely understood, you can clarify what, rather than have them not be in place at all. But even with that being said, the confusion may be incentive for some businesses to decide that, well, until we know exactly what we're supposed to do, we're just going to keep doing what we're doing. So there, there is a, it's a double-edged sword in that situation. Yeah, and uh, another thing, just so you know, you can go on the state of Michigan's uh, website, and we have a link to that here on civiccentertv.com. If you go to the top of the page, click on coronavirus, and then you'll see the state of Michigan. If you uh, click on that page, I was checking this out yesterday, uh, looking at this story, and they do um, document where the outbreaks have been. And maybe it's outdated information that's on the state of Michigan's website, but I was looking for restaurants here in our region, and there were no reported outbreaks at restaurants. And there were, it, it, the number was actually very low. Most of the outbreaks, of course, were occurring at long-term um, nursing facilities, prisons, as well as schools. That's where the majority of the outbreaks were. So it'd be interesting to see, too, uh, the take that the uh, restaurant industry has on the numbers of outbreaks coming out uh, and how that's being documented as well. Maybe that information is just out of date because uh, the state typically will update the numbers once a week. And that is uh, the case with how they do document and update the outbreaks at schools. And so that number comes out on Monday afternoons. And yesterday they announced more than 6,000 students and staff have been infected by coronavirus in new and ongoing school-related outbreaks. And uh, again, that's according to the data released by the Michigan Part of Health and Human Services. That includes 606 students and staff at outbreaks in 126 schools serving preschoolers through high school. But the bulk of the cases, uh, about 5,400, just over 5,400, involve outbreaks on or around 28 college campuses. In the case of K through 12 outbreaks, it only reflects people who were infected at schools or during a school-related activity, such as sports. But college numbers do include students affected at parties or other off-campus activities not sponsored by the school. Uh, the COVID out, uh, a COVID-19 outbreak, by the way, just as a reminder, is defined as two or more cases with a link by place and time indicating a shared exposure outside of a household. And of course, the, the increase in the numbers playing into some of the decisions by local schools and school districts across the state to go back to remote learning. West Bloomfield yesterday made that announcement along with some of the other schools here in the greater West Bloomfield area. I believe Huron Valley also made the, the decision to roll back and go remote. Yeah, I think we're going to see a lot more of this coming up, especially in Oakland County as uh, one of the justifications that was made yesterday by Deanna Barish from the, one of the administrators in West Bloomfield's school district is that the county's grading of E as far as severity and severity of the COVID-19 outbreak is in, in the local area, uh, that's definitely going to be a motivating factor for some of these school districts that have now been told ba basically by the county that we're at a very high risk level of spreading the virus in our schools and it might be best to make some contingency plans. Some are gonna go into effect right away, like West Bloomfield has done, like Huron Valley has done, and others may wait, but I think that more of those are to come. A little bit of good news for some U of M students. The emergency stay in place order that was issued for University of Michigan students is not going to be extended. It expired this morning at 7 a.m. The proportion of, uh, propor proportion let me get that out this morning, of local COVID-19 cases associated with U of M has decreased. The reduction in new university-associated cases has allowed case investigators and contact tracers to catch up. That's according to a news release from the health officials. Overall, the number of cases in Washtenaw County remain high, and weekly test positivity has increased to nearly 4%. 
When the stay in place order was issued two weeks ago, more than 60% of Washtenaw County cases were associated with U of M students and case investigators and contact tracers were unable to keep up with the sharp increase in the cases. Uh, experts said and student cases now represent about one third of the local COVID-19 cases. My uh, my guess, though, is that uh, this is going to continue um, to be an up and down situation, because, again, once you lift those orders, the students are going to go back to the things that they were doing before cases are going to go up. So then what's going to happen? They're probably going to issue another stay at home order as well. Although I believe the semester at U of M is going to be ending uh, pretty soon. I know, I believe it's before Thanksgiving. Yeah, I, I believe that is the case also. And, and what I'm thinking is if as they reopen this, if they have a recurrence of the problem that ultimately led them to issue this stay at home order for U of M students, I wouldn't be surprised if they make a decision to start the next semester completely remote at this point because if, if you have that re reoccur that means your student body is clearly not going to follow those restrictions you put in place those recommendations that are in place and you're going to have to do this repeatedly which is going to interrupt your schooling it's going to interrupt your operations it's definitely going to have you in some hot water with washington county and with the state of michigan so to avoid all of that the, the easiest option would be to tell your students well if you can't be responsible study at home or don't study at all and go to and go to remote so i wouldn't be surprised if that is something that they that they take out of their tool bag here in a little bit also making headlines this morning on civiccentertv.com an oakland county clinic is now offering rapid covid 19 tests to employers and academic institutions berkeley urgent care has the federally has been federally approved Quidel Sophia 2 test, which provides results in 15 minutes. The cost is $100 per person. The test is not covered by insurance. It's available by appointment or walk-in at the clinic on Greenfield Road, that's in Berkeley. It's really designed for asymptomatic patients who need clearance for work, school, or a medical procedure or maybe to catch a flight, as we saw yesterday, the city of New York now requiring people flying into the state to have a, a negative COVID-19 test within three days. So the antigen test delivers a highly accurate positive result and gives patients results within minutes rather than waiting days for results with prior tests. Testing comes as coronavirus cases surge in the state. On Monday, Michigan added 6,709 new cases, 17 more deaths so if this is as accurate as what they are saying this is a good um uh, something that's good a good alternative for people out there who need that test and need that result back quickly for various reasons yeah it's definitely going to be something that i think will be put to good use by a lot of people that are in tight situations where you know maybe they have a family matter in a state like new york that's requiring a negative test or a, a quarantine of several of several days upon entering the state this could be the difference between you being able to attend to a emergency family matter or go to a, a funeral or whatever the case could be uh, that's an emergency out there and not being able to or getting back to work in a timely manner is another p potential option or or whatever the case may be that justifies having this kind of a rapid test i think that if it's out there people are going to want to use it and if it's being used for good reason it's good news I wonder if this is going to uh, pretty much be the way of the future until a vaccine is widely available that in order to do a lot of things, you're going to have to have a negative COVID-19 test. I know yeah. um, it's already happening on college campuses where they're requiring some of the students prior to returning to have them and some workplaces as well or if you're taking a school trip things of that nature so it'll be interesting to see how this plays out of course one of the biggest issues in the beginning the tests were not always accurate and reliable yeah. so if they can improve the testing that's going to be i think a key component for us to get our economy back up and running and on track so again you can find all those headlines and so much more on civiccentertv.com and as a reminder you can also find the links to the cdc the state of michigan oakland county as well as our local communities right there at the top of the page we try to make it easy for you to be able to do your own research on uh, some of these stories as i said i check the uh, state of michigan's page pretty much every day uh, look at the numbers that are coming out uh, just to try to give them some 
context as to what is actually happening here in the state of Michigan. So we make it easy for you to do your own research. Uh, a lot to, going on here on this yeah. election day uh, coverage uh, with the Oakland County Megacast. Um, we are going to be speaking with Dr. Kevin Ball. He is the Dean of the School of Health Sciences over at Oakland University. Um, it'd be fascinating to speak with him. What is it like to be a medical doctor in the middle of this pandemic? Because I feel like they see things so much differently than what just regular people such as you and I do. We'll be speaking with the journalism program director over at um, the Oakland Post at Oakland University as well. Uh, what's this like for journalism? Today is going to be a big, big day. Oh, yeah. uh, of course, a lot of my former co-workers uh, election day is a very long day uh, for those that work in the news industry, but this is an election like none other. So it'll be interesting to see how things play out from a journalistic standpoint. Uh, we'll also be speaking with Terry Johnson. He's an attorney and also uh, the legal operations VP for firearms legal protection. One of the big debates going into today's election, of course, surrounding voter intimidation and open carry laws. Um, the court took it up. However, they did not make a ruling. So as of right now, you are allowed to open carry at polling places, although a lot of polling places already ha were churches or schools where you couldn't take a gun anyway. So it'll be interesting to hear from him and get his perspective on that issue about guns and polling locations. And we'll also be, sp also be speaking with the director uh, residential marketing and community relations at the Jewish Senior Life, another industry and organization that's been uh, touched so greatly and directly uh, by this pandemic. And then we'll be rounding out the show speaking with Big Dip Burgers. That's in Walled Lake. They just opened in May. Boy, talk about a tough time to open a new business and a restaurant at that. So a lot ahead here on the Oakland County Megacast. Uh, Tyler and I are going to take a quick break and we'll be back in just a couple minutes. Michigan, we're calling on you to save lives. Don't ignore it. Don't let it go to voicemail. It's urgent. In fact, it's critical. Because if you've been in close contact with someone who tests positive for COVID-19, you may have been exposed to the virus. And you could get a call from My COVID Help or your local health department. So please answer the call to learn how to protect yourself, your family, and friends. We're calling on you to stop the spread of COVID-19, to make it safe to reopen businesses and help Michigan move forward. So if you get a call, from my COVID help or your local health department, you may have been exposed to someone with COVID-19. To protect us all, answer the call. Learn more at michigan.gov slash contain COVID. A message from the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. Hi, I'm Dr. Jonay Caldoun. I'm the Chief Medical Executive for the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. The people who are at highest risk of getting severely ill from COVID-19 are the elderly, and those with chronic medical conditions. That includes people with heart disease, diabetes, COPD, or those who have compromised immune systems. People who are in those categories should right now be staying at home as much as possible and not going out if it is not essential. If you fit into one of those categories, those are the things you should do. And if you have a family member who fits into one of those categories, you should be checking in on them and making sure they are following those guidelines. There's something everyone can do to protect the community from COVID-19. Thank you for tuning in to the Oakland County Megacast. I'm Ronnie Dahl here in the studio alongside Taylor Keith. Always great to have you tuning in to the Oakland County Megacast. And as a reminder, we are here in the studios Monday through Friday, 10 a.m. to noon. You can catch us on Civic Center TV, Birmingham Area Municipal Access, Channel 15 on Comcast, Channel 99 on AT&T. If you're out driving around, tune us in to the radio, 89.3 Lakes FM, 88.1 FM, The Biff. And then today is... Oakland University is our Facebook partner of the day. We want to say thank you to the university for allowing us to live stream today's edition of the Oakland County Megacast on 
their Facebook page. So thank you to them. We're going to kick off the show today by bringing in Dr. Kevin Ball. He's the Dean of the School of Health Sciences at Oakland University. What an exciting time, or an interesting time, rather, to be in your field because to experience a pandemic has to be um, something that did you ever think that you would go through? Uh, absolutely uh, not. Uh, and I, you know, I, we, we have many people who study pandemics and we've been well aware of the possibilities. Uh, but, you know, you, you don't really think it's, it's going to happen. And of course, here it is. Uh, and it's, it's pretty dramatic. Uh, and I think the other point we have at Oakland University, while I represent the School of Health Sciences, we have a School of Nursing and also the Oakland University William Beaumont School of Medicine. So uh, quite a number of us uh, work in the health arena, in the health medical arena. And uh, this was not really predictable in, in, in the typical sense. And knowing that and knowing your background, what what has it been like for, for you as well as the students to try to study this and figure out the next steps? You know, <laughs> It's a difficult situation, as we've all experienced. Uh, we had to, within the space of two days, completely change the the educational delivery. We went, uh, you know, as of I think the 14th or so of, of March. Two days later, we were fully online, uh, remote learning. Uh, we we couldn't even, and for faculty, we, we had two days to know. Uh, we couldn't even have people going back into the building for a period of time. So uh, it was a dramatic, a dramatic change. Uh, that, that of course was was dramatic for faculty. It was dramatic for the entire university, and of course the students. Uh, but I have to say, um, uh, incredible group of people, all of us, uh, because you know people pulled together rapidly. There were faculty helping each other out. Some of them were familiar with with uh, online learning models, but but some of them had been teaching for some years and had not been uh, working with those kinds of technologies and. People pulled together. The students were very, very understanding. Um, there were a lot of, uh, you know, help and support groups that formed. And next thing you know, uh, we, we were well underway. Um, but the, the other point is, we're, we're training people for for careers in health, uh, many different types of careers in health, and it's the you know real world uh, to help people in in their lives. And um, th this couldn't be a more meaningful time to be in a career uh, for health, and to be training to to help others. With that, uh, do you think a, a pandemic such as this is helping to inspire some students to want to go into this field because they want to help more? Or is it deflecting from the industry because people are afraid to go into the industry? You know, it's a little a little difficult to know for sure. Uh, the, the, um, the entire uh, country, as you know, a lot of the media covered this, uh, the entire country was seeing a decline in students going to universities. Uh, there, you know, the idea of oh, taking a gap year or something along that lines, um, which uh, you know I don't think is a, was a good choice. I think uh, we've moved well into the into to providing safe forms of education here, and uh, I think that students can move right along in their careers. But th the numbers have declined a, a little overall. That having been said, though, we held on pretty strong at Oakland University broadly, and certainly in the health careers, uh, we've done very well uh, holding our numbers while there was a general decline. And the other thing I, I think we're seeing is um, people with a lot more interest in the public health arenas. We have a Department of Public and Environmental Wellness that includes the Master of Public Health program, the undergraduate program in wellness and health promotion, and then an undergraduate program in environmental health and safety and also a, a safety management. So those fields have, have picked up actually quite a bit. Uh, in fact, our, our Master of Public Health program has saw its largest uh, in, in enrollment this year uh, in the midst of this, this coronavirus. Dr. Kevin Ball with us here on the Oakland County Megacast. He's the Dean of the School of Health Sciences over at Oakland University. Uh, dean, I know that you started the Health Allergy Symposium program. For those not familiar with it, what exactly is it and what is the goal of the program? 
So we started this program four years ago. It's healthology. So ology is the study of, or the knowledge of, and in the idea is all things health. Uh, the, the, we have four different departments at our School of Health Sciences. So we also designed this healthology event to rotate through the four different departments. And uh, this year would have been the, the, the fourth department. We would have done the full cycle. Uh, but, um, and each year uh, we cover contemporary health topics uh, there, is a, there is a public facing portion of this. Uh, what we've typically been doing is we've had an evening event, uh, such as the one that we're going to talk about today, uh, and that's open to the public. And, and it's typically been done at the Open Center in, on campus live. And then we have a full day event, which is a, uh, a, a professional development event uh, in, inviting uh, medical professionals and health professionals throughout uh, to do upgrading and training uh, in discussions in, in different fields. So we've, we've rotated the topics through. We've, we've covered uh, interdisciplinary health uh, sciences around uh, food distribution networking. Uh, we've, we've covered clinical and diagnostic sciences, uh, the idea of, of the, the, the science of understanding the human body physiologically and what we, what we do with that information to, to really uh, treat and help people. Uh, and we've, we've covered um, this broad idea of upstream health for downstream care. Upstream health is what we do in the community. It's what we do uh, to promote a positive health and wellness uh, in, in, in the environment uh, around the communities. And downstream care is what happens when, you know, we all have to go to downstream care at some point to, to, to have our, uh, our health taken care of by medical professionals. Um, now this year we were, we were focusing on uh, our human movement science department with the goals of looking at um, activity and physical activity and uh, rehabilitation and what, what uh, the advantages of that. But that got thrown out the window because COVID came along and, uh, and put us all into the environments that we're in. So um, are, are we, we moved the event as far as we could out into the future and we decided now that we're going to do a virtual event, which is uh, Thursday, November 12th. And that event is this year, it's, we've changed the title. We, we, we've gone with Beyond COVID, um, Igniting Innovation in Health. So the idea is beyond COVID. I, I listened to the, the start of your program today. And of course, we're not entirely beyond COVID, but we wanted to talk about uh, what the COVID environment has done uh, and what we've done as a society to, to rebound and bring some positive thoughts um, towards uh, um, getting getting through this. How important is it to have this collaboration of so many different people with so many different backgrounds coming together? What is the and what is the long term impact that you think that will have have on the health industry? You know, it is the essential uh, ingredient, really. Uh, you know that we we have we have brilliant people. We've got. Um, um, all fields that that we need to take care of people in society um, we individually do very well in in many of the areas that we work but what's really needed ultimately is collaboration and cooperation and communication uh, bringing people together to try to solve problems um, and, and break down the barriers that that tend to exist uh, with excellence in training uh, you know people come very very good at, at, at their individual fields uh, but not always recognizing that there's someone working down the hall or in the build or the building across the street or someone in the community that that has the answer to the question that that one person doesn't have uh, and so that's the point of our healthology symposium and it's about collaboration and communication uh, and this year we were uh, really focused on this idea of beyond COVID. in other words you know COVID is has impacted each of us it's impacted individuals it's impacted the health of of, the, of all of us uh, it's changed the way we focus, or where we function in society, and yet um, at the same time, it's it's caused um, large um, uh, numbers of people to be greatly disadvantaged uh, in in uh, urban communities, uh, even in rural communities. Uh, and what we need to do is pull together with all of the resources we have, uh, with all of the professions that we have, uh, to uh, to really find solutions to to help people. And that's what this event is all about. Uh, we have uh, 12 speakers from uh, a whole array of different uh, fields, uh, which we can I can talk a little bit more about as we go along. With that, from a student standpoint, what impact will this have on them long term and their careers? Do you think? 
Right. So every one of these areas that we talk about uh, where we we're, have speakers, we also have students placed in, in those fields and, and uh, alumni and, and graduates that are, um, uh, that are working in all of these fields. And that's one of the things we have to realize is, uh, you know, that the, 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 the need for health and, and uh, upstream health, downstream care is everywhere. It's ongoing. It's in every field. Uh, uh, and every kind of condition that we have to take care of, of, of people in. Uh, and so while, we've, while we're fighting this virus and we're recognizing the difficulties of trying to educate people, we also know that we, we gotta keep doing this uh, because we need uh, the future, uh, uh, you know, the physician, the future uh, exercise uh, scientists, the physical therapists, the radiologic technologists, et cetera, et cetera. Dr. Kevin Ball with us. He's the Dean of the School of Health Sciences at Oakland University, joining us today on the program. And uh, Dr. Ball, you, you spoke earlier about how important collaboration is going to be in the post-COVID world, particularly in health sciences and in those career paths. How important on top of that collaboration is versatility in these variety of health science career paths going to be for students that are going into the industry and for those who are already in the industries uh, within health sciences to be able to learn new things and maybe cross over into different areas as we tackle the next big problems ahead of COVID. Right, uh, that's absolutely true. I, I, you know, uh, we, we've, of course, we've tried to provide a, a, a strong basis of, of, of health of knowledge to every one of our students, and then they would specialize in the individual fields in which they, uh, they work. Uh, but what we found in, in COVID, I mean, this was such an acute and such a, a, a wild situation um, that, and you'll hear this in, in the speakers that, that, that speak in our event, uh, that you know the entire hospital systems were were completely uh, changed over to to be emergency care for COVID. That meant that regular treatments that people would be receiving or uh, elective surgeries, of course, canceled. Uh, but just the ongoing uh, maintenance of areas were were not being able to be uh, delivered. Uh, people that were trained as, as say physical therapists for a period of time could not deliver physical therapy because the patients weren't in the, in, in the environments and they wouldn't and they didn't want to come to be honest uh you know people that had uh, recent surgeries and would, would have wanted to have physical therapy but everyone was afraid and uh they weren't they weren't really willing to put themselves at risk reasonably so um, so that meant that physical therapists became uh, uh support workers for other fields in health um, you know, the, 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 everyone rallied around the idea of what do we need to do and how do we do it as well as we can. And when you think about, you know, some of the aspects of our society today where there seems to be a battle constantly, uh, today happens to be election day, um, this is an example of where we pulled together, where, where society and in all the fields in health really said, hey, I'm putting aside my personal uh, concerns right now. We've got to work as a team, and we've got to save lives. And it was it was an incredible crisis that we had to rise to. That is one of the good things coming out of this crisis is that so many people are coming together that maybe wouldn't have done so uh, prior to this. And one of the other things I think has been an advantage or also teaching us to do things differently and one of those being virtual and when we go virtual it was hard to embrace sometimes in the beginning and there are still some you know kinks along the way you may have a little bit of a zoom leg or something of that nature but it also opens up the door for so many of these events such as the one you have coming up for more people to be able to attend who maybe couldn't do so in person. So with that, uh, how can people who may be listening or watching this, how can they um, get involved or uh, take part in the symposium? Okay, thanks very much for the, for the opportunity to invite everyone. Uh, it, it, uh, it's www.oakland.edu slash SHS, the School of Health Sciences. And that's the website that you need to go to on Thursday, uh, November 12th, and it's a 5.30 program. If you go to that website, there will be a, a link that you can click on and, and away you go, you're, you're in, in watching our, our program. And there's a 45 minute video, uh, which uh, includes all of the speakers, the 12 speakers across the various uh, uh, arrays of, uh, of our healthcare system. And then we follow that up with a 45 minute uh, networking uh, virtual chat room 
uh, which again, all the links will be on that website. So that's oakland.edu uh, slash SHS. And uh, that's, that's the website. Uh, also, if people are interested in, uh, wanted to share any uh, thoughts or, uh, around the healthology, uh, we have a website in, or not a website, an email address, in health, I N H E A L T H, one word, in health at oakland.edu. And you can reach uh, me and, and uh, the people that are, um, will, that once you've seen the show, of course, uh, you'll be able to uh, uh, ask further questions at that website. Uh, so yeah, that's the uh, that's the way to to, uh, to to see what's going on and be part of it. Uh, and the goals are, of course, that we uh, that we do bring people together. Our, the slogan of the Healthology Symposium is where science, practice, and social interests meet. And uh, those are words chosen carefully. Science, of course, we are the health sciences. Practice is the health practices. Social interests, well, it's about the interests that we have in society for, for maintaining the health of people, but it's also meant to be social in, in a sense of bringing together in a networking environment. So you mentioned the importance of the virtual methods like the Zoom and, and other things. And um, you know, we really have to take advantage of these uh, technologies. If you imagine, could you imagine that maybe 15 years ago, if this were to happen, we would not have had these kinds of abilities of, of communicating. But today we're very fortunate to have the technologies available. And we have to make use of those technologies to have these kinds of conversations. Uh, you know, I think we would all rather be in one place. I, I start the program out by saying that we'd all rather be together physically. But if we can't be, uh, we still have a lot of great opportunities through these virtual uh, systems. Uh, there'll be the ability in that program with the networking uh, chat rooms to actually send in uh, through a text message your questions and there will be people uh, available to pose those questions to the experts. So again, the uh, symposium is going to be taking place Thursday, November 12th. It is free to the public. Any, who would benefit from uh, tuning in to this? Well, we, we designed it to be uh, anyone with, with interest in tr understanding um, how uh, COVID has influenced our society and how we have fought back to, uh, to, to kind of uh, respond. Um, you know, uh, the, the idea is on creative solutions developed across different health sectors uh, in response to the unique challenges of the pandemic. Uh, we have stories of diverse health leaders who uh, have, you know, created had creative problem solving, have, have determined ways to, to continue to provide uh, health and, and uh, medical support uh, to patients. Uh, the idea of, of, of a food distribution system has been changed, uh, in, in particularly in the Pontiac uh, area. And, um, you know, this is these are success stories, really. Uh, I, I realize, again, that we're still fighting this, but we have to pull pull some uh, uh, some good things out of what's happening, and the good things are that we found different ways uh, through telehealth, for example, uh, and uh, through um, you know, just networking and more conversation, communication, cooperation amongst the different professions, which we'll talk about in in the in the show that uh, that evening. Well, we so appreciate having you with us here on the Oakland County Megacast. Dr. Kevin Ball, he is the Dean of the School of Health Sciences at Oakland University. We wish you the best of luck with the event and also thank you for putting it together because it is an important conversation for us and here, all of us here in the area to have and hopefully some good things and a lot of solutions come out of the collaboration at the symposium. Well, thanks very much. Uh, excited to, to be able to have the opportunity, uh, uh, and I'm glad that you were inv invited us, uh, invited me here today. I re really appreciate it. So that's terrific. Uh, so looking forward to meeting everyone in healthology. Thank you so much. Tyler and I are going to take a quick break here on the Oakland County Megacast. Still a lot to get to as we continue the Tuesday edition of the Oakland County Megacast. This may seem uncomfortable, but so is being hooked to an IV sleeping in a hospital bed and fighting for your life. When it comes to COVID-19, comfort is not as important as saving lives. Wearing a mask can greatly reduce the chance of spreading the virus. So mask up, Michigan. 
every time you leave home. Hi, my name is Kurt Lawson, and I'm the Public Information Officer for West Bloomfield Township. We wanted to reach out to you, our older adults, to provide information that you may find useful during this difficult time. We want to ensure you that West Bloomfield Town Hall, our Waters and Utility Department, West Bloomfield Parks, and our Police and Fire Departments continue to work hard on your behalf. Information and resources can be found on the Township website, the Police Facebook and Twitter, or call West Bloomfield Parks COVID-19 Help Hotline. Please remember to keep your social distance of at least six feet, wear facial coverings when you leave your home, and wash your hands for at least 20 seconds with soap. These precautions will help keep you safe during these difficult times. Thank you for tuning in to the Tuesday edition of the Oakland County Megacast. It is election day. And I just saw a post from some of my neighbors. We have like a, a WhatsApp chat going on and it looks like the lines are still pretty long over there at Kegel Harbor's uh, city offices. So people really getting out and exercising their right to vote. For those that work in the world of news, this is a crazy day for them. It's a very long day as they navigate all things um, election day related. It's a long night. Um, some people, you know, when you work the night shift, you're uh, pretty much around the clock. But I think this year it is going to be completely different how newsrooms are covering the election. Uh, let's bring in Gary Gilbert to the show. He is the um, journalism program director and advisor to the Oakland Post over at Oakland University. It's going to be a different election night in the world of journalism. It's an election like no other in my lifetime, that's for sure. Knowing that, uh, I definitely don't believe we're going to start seeing any big results uh, coming out of tonight just because of the record number of people that are going to be voting. From your standpoint with some of your students, what is their take on this year's election? The students that I work with, of course, are all journalism majors. And uh, we also have at the Oakland Post a number of political science majors. And of course, they are very attuned to what's going on. Um, the students have been making plans for months uh, for this edition. Uh, we have a print edition that goes out to our campus on Wednesdays. And we work on that all week and of course, for tonight's, um, as we go to production for tonight's uh, print edition of the Post, we have three different covers planned. Um, we have a cover planned in case uh, President Trump is reelected. We have a cover plan in case it appears that Joe Biden is going to be elected. And then the cover that we expect to use, of course, will be one that indicates too close to call or that we don't know yet because the vote has not yet been counted. That's so unusual. I spent most of my career working in the newsrooms of daily newspapers. Um, election night was always a, a chaotic but fun night. We'd bring in pizza and have a great time while we waited for county clerks and city clerks to call us with their results. But usually most nights by 10, 11, midnight, we had a pretty good idea of what was going to be happening. Of course, the exception being that, um, that strange November night in the year 2000. I was the editor of a daily newspaper and we put out a, uh, a headline and, a, and an edition at around 2 a.m. saying Bush squeaks in. Well, George W. Bush did win that election and he did squeak in, but it was uh, almost six weeks later before we actually knew that that headline turned out to be true. And speaking of that, because some uh, news organizations in the past have called elections one way or the other and they've turned out to be wrong. Mm -hmm. One of the benefits of today's technology is we are getting more up-to-date information from the clerk's offices. But knowing that, do you think as some of these news organizations are going to be so quick with putting mm -hmm. out uh, a prediction, or do you think they're going to hold back this year? Uh, the articles that I've been reading and the statements that I've been seeing indicate that most news organizations are going to be a little bit more cautious this year in making any calls. Of course, if you go back to that election of 2000, uh, 
um, the Associated Press famously, uh, famous at least in journalism circles, did not call that election for George W. Bush, despite the fact that major news organizations, uh, NBC, CNN, uh, declared Al Gore the winner of, I'm sorry, declared George W. Bush the winner of Florida, and then around 3 a.m. started to back off of that call. Uh, we fast forward to the election of 2016. Um, that was a no good, very bad, horrible year for not just pollsters, but for journalism, for news organizations. Because although pollsters came pretty close to getting the, um, the numbers correct for the popular vote, um, news organizations such as the New York Times um, projected Hillary Clinton as the winner, a 99% chance of being the winner. Uh, 538.com, which is um, Nate Silver's uh, website, uh, came closer with uh, their projection that President Trump had about a 30% chance to win. Um, the um, Famously, you remember um, on the evening of the election in November 2016, the Detroit Free Press projected Hillary Clinton as the winner of the state of Michigan. That was around 9 o'clock. I was at the offices of the campus newspaper that night, and we were all looking at that and saying, okay, uh, the Free Press has projected that Hillary Clinton has won Michigan. Before we go with that, let's see if anybody else confirms that. Uh, what we were really waiting for was the Associated Press, because the AP has a reputation as an honest broker, as a straight shooter, and that the AP won't call a race until it's clear that, the, um, that there's no chance that they're going to be wrong. Um, and as we waited that night, uh, no other news organization made that call, which led us to believe that perhaps the free press was wrong. It was an embarrassing moment, certainly, for the uh, editorial staff at the Detroit Free Press. And knowing that when news organizations are making these calls and they're making them early because we are in different time zones. So if you're mm -hmm. making a call based on Michigan's time zone, could that impact the outcome of the race? Because maybe people in California are seeing, oh, this candidate has already won. I don't need to go vote. I think there's some evidence that that might be true, but it's not widespread. Um, we have a long history in this country of news organizations using exit polling to project winners as soon as the polls close in a certain state. Um, that system um, is still being used in this election by, I think, uh, most of the major television networks, uh, NBC, CBS. However, you may know that the Associated Press and Fox News are working together on this election, and they've decided to use a different uh, system that they call SmartCast or VoteCast. Um, and the AP and Fox are going to be, I think you're going to see the AP and Fox be a little bit more um, reluctant to go with uh, the announcement of a winner unless the, those news organizations are certain, completely positive, beyond the shadow of a doubt, that they've got it right. The other uh, the TV networks have said that they're going to be more cautious, um, but they are using that more traditional uh, exit polling as a factor in determining whether they'll make projections. Of course, this um, as I mentioned at the start, this election is unlike no other that you and I have experienced. And I first voted in 1972. This election, because almost 100 million people in America have already voted using some type of early voting system, um, the, um, the exit polling just won't work the same way that it has in past elections. How much is social media going to play a role in this election, do you believe? <laughs> I made a promise to myself this morning that I would um, stay off social media today. Really? Um, <laughs> Has it worked so far? No, uh, no, no, actually it hasn't worked. <laughs> uh, you caught me. Um, you, <laughs> you know, there is research done by uh, the Pew Institution that shows that people who uh, get their news primarily through social media, tend to be less informed and tend to be less engaged in what's going on. I think that certainly could be the case in this election. Um, I, I am an avid user of social media, uh, particularly Twitter. And I do think it's, uh, for journalists, it's a great way to get story ideas. It's a great way to look at uh, trending topics, to discover what people might be talking about but we also need to remind ourselves that about 
I think what the research shows, something like 90% of uh, tweets are posted by about 10% of Twitter users, uh, and that they're often not representative of the population as a whole. So we need to be careful about making any judgments based on things that we read on uh, Twitter or Facebook or Instagram. But we're also hearing, I think even more so this election going into today's election, about so much disinformation being spread across various Mm -hmm. platforms of social media. Do you think that's going to possibly play into how journalists are covering this election? Or is it more just a warning? That's a great point. I think it's a warning. Um, You know, Americans have a complicated relationship with the news media. Um, Trust levels in the news media have never been particularly high. Um, We could go back to Watergate in 1972, 1973, 1974, and we'll see that according to Gallup polling and according to other research done at that time, that uh, public trust in the news media was fairly high, but we're talking 50 to 60 percent. We can fast forward to September 11th, 2001, right after the terrorist attacks. The uh, trust in the news media rose as a result uh, because Americans felt the news organizations were doing a pretty good job of covering that traumatic event in this country. In 2016, though, we see a sharp decline in media and in Americans' trust in the news media. Uh, It's always been complicated. Today, of course, uh, trust in the media is skewed by partisanship. Um, The numbers are actually pretty good in 2020 as far as uh, Americans' trust in the media, but it's skewed by um, which which party you affiliate with. Democrats generally say the news media are fulfilling their role as watchdogs. They're doing a good job. Of course, you know what's happening there is that um, many uh, Democrats um, People who uh, view themselves as liberals politically uh, think that President Trump is doing a poor job and they're looking to the news media to behave in that traditional watchdog role and to report uh, on the president's lies or the, whatever the president engages in t- some type of disinformation. On the other side, of course, uh, polling shows that Republicans tend to distrust the media even more. They feel like the news media, generally speaking, are unfair to the president. Um, When they also, the polling shows that um, Republicans, when they see mistakes in the news media, tend to think that those mistakes are deliberate, that, that it's actually disinformation, not just misinformation. Gary Gilbert with us. He's the journalism program director and the advisor to the Oakland Post at Oakland University with us today on the program. And Gary, as your students are preparing to and are actively reporting on this election today with the circumstances of the 2020 election being unprecedented and knowing that we very well may not have several positions on the ballot at the top of the ballot statewide and nationwide to report on today, what are you advising them as they're reporting on this election? Because ultimately the public still is looking to them for some information coming out of election night about where their votes are where their votes are going where the the votes are trending who may be elected and who is elected but you have to be careful with it because we may not have the full results on election day or even days forward absolutely and i mentioned at the top of the uh of this uh, broadcast that We've spent a lot of time planning this edition. Uh, Michael Pierce is the editor-in-chief. I think you've had Michael on your show. Uh, He did a very good job. Emily Morris is the managing editor. Uh, We've spent a lot of time in talking about uh, how do we put out a Wednesday morning edition of the campus newspaper in a situation where we probably won't know who the winner of the presidential election is. So that uh, caused us to refocus on some ideas along the lines of let's talk to students, let's talk to faculty members, let's talk to uh, uh, staff on the campus. Let's ask them, no matter who wins, what direction do you want to see the country go? No matter who wins, what do you think are the major problems that this country faces? No matter who wins, what should we be talking about? What are the most important topics? So that's what um, we're focused on tonight. And that's the addition that I expect that we'll be using. 
Um, of course, I mentioned that we will have, uh, we'll be flexible. Um, we'll be working late. Uh, and if we have a chance to, if, if the, the Associated Press uh, decides at uh, midnight or 1 a.m. that uh, we have a winner, uh, we'll certainly report that. But I don't expect that that will be the case. Gary, with that, uh, your uh, old school journalism, this world has changed considerably. And we have a president who is um, calling out the media any chance he gets, fake news. And knowing that and knowing where we stand and where journalism stands right now as a whole, what are your predictions and what are you telling your students going forward? Because there's so much pressure on members of the media to get the information out first and fast. There are <laughs> deadlines. There is a dead, no longer the five o'clock news, the six o'clock news, or with the print. Um, those deadlines have shifted. The deadline is now. What are you telling your students about the future of journalism? It's a great question. We have about 75 students at Oakland University who are majoring in journalism. We, in every class, uh, every section of every class. And one of the courses that I teach is um, media uh, ethics. When I tell people that I teach ethics and I mean, that must be a really short class because everybody knows that the media have no ethics. But these are topics that we talk about in every section about the fact about facts matter, um, that it's our job as journalists to try to find the truth the best obtainable version of the truth is the quote that Bob Woodward and Carl Bernstein always used to use. I really like that quote because I think that shows that there's um, the more people you talk to, the closer you can get to the truth. But sometimes it's impossible to find truth. So we look for facts that we can verify. We, re we report these facts only if we have multiple sources who say that that's true. That's, I think, the only way to restore the faith in the news media that seems to be so lacking, uh, particularly now on the part of um, uh, President Trump's followers. Complicating this, of course, is that in today's world, we disagree on basic facts. Uh, I like to talk to my students about the um, some of the basic uh, news stories that, um, such as climate change despite the fact that 97% of environmental scientists say that climate change is happening, that it's a threat to the future of the planet, and that it's caused by humans, you know, I know, that there's a significant portion of the country and uh, the population of the world that believes that climate change is fabricated, that it's a hoax. Um, I like to challenge them with uh, news events from the past. For example, uh, did man really land on the moon? How do we know that men landed on the moon? They brought back some rocks. We have some grainy videotape. But if you do a Google search on moon landing conspiracy theories, you will find that there's a, a lot of people out there who think that the whole thing was faked, done on a Hollywood soundstage so far, uh, somewhere. Um, another burning uh, question in American history that we disagree about is who killed JFK? Uh, we know the Warren Commission, which is a bipartisan panel, uh, put together a uh, about a 30 volume investigative report that said uh, John F. Kennedy was killed by Lee Harvey Oswald acting alone. Yet there are multiple movies, books, magazine articles, um, documentaries about other alternative theories on who killed JFK. My point is, is that it's often difficult to get to the truth. The way to get to the truth is to use multiple sources to talk to as many people as possible. And that's what we emphasize with our students. Even then, even then, we know that there will be people who will disagree on what we consider to be basic truths. Uh, if you go back to the 1960s in this country, most of us sat around uh, at night, 6.30, we watched Walter Cronkite or the NBC Evening News, and there were only three or four news, uh, there were only three or four uh, networks, and we sort of had a shared sense of uh, reality. Today, that's simply not the case. We have 500 channels on television. Uh, we have uh, social media, of course. 
and we don't have that shared sense anymore of what is true. Yeah, and I think in some uh, regards to uh, journalism and how it's gone corporate and with reporters under such incredibly tight deadlines, it doesn't give them the time to actually do some of the reporting that needs to be done. So in some ways, they've helped contribute to that mistrust within the media because reporters aren't given the time to be able to accurately uh, get out that information as well because it's about getting that story out and getting it out first. So you have a tough job ahead of you teaching the new generation of journalists, but thank you so much for doing it and doing it with passion and uh, allowing them to be able to develop those skills because we definitely are going to need great journalists going forward. And while it's going to look a lot different than what it did back in the day, they are important uh, to the future as well and getting that information out. Good luck uh, to you and your team tonight, though. I hope you get at least some good pizza, not uh, not the, uh, you know, uh, the cardboard pizza that's going to be around at one in the morning. Uh, we'll spring for the good stuff. And thank you. And I, I, I absolutely agree with your statement. Uh, quality journalism has never been more needed in our country than it is right now. Yep, yeah, it'd be interesting. We'll like to we'd like to have you back on uh, after the election, maybe in a couple weeks and talk about journalism as a whole. Is there a way for nonprofit journalism to actually survive or independent journalism i'd like to get your uh, take on that but we're running a little bit behind good luck to you and your team tonight on the election and your election coverage gary gilbert with us on the oakland county megacast he's the journalism program director and advisor to the oakland post over at oakland university you are listening to 89.3 wbld orchard lake 88.1 wbfh Bloomfield Hills. We're going to take a quick break here and return with the second hour of the Oakland County Megacast. As rivals, we don't always see eye to eye. Like who scored the best recruits? Who's going to be who? And whether we wear green or blue. But one thing we can all agree on to help stop the spread of COVID-19. Wear a mask. 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 The ball's in your court, Michigan. Michigan, we still need to stay careful because we don't want to go backwards. Back to where we started. So keep standing six feet apart. Keep wearing a mask in public. And if you have symptoms, talk to a healthcare provider about getting tested. To move forward, Let's all do our part. So stay careful. Michigan.gov slash coronavirus. Thank you for sticking around for the second hour of the Oakland County Megacast on this election day. As a reminder, you can catch us on Civic Center TV. Birmingham Area Municipal Access, Channel 15 on Comcast, Channel 99 on AT&T. If you're out driving around in your car, 89.3 Lakes FM, 88.1 FM, The Biff. And thank you to Oakland University today for allowing us to live stream today's edition of the Oakland County Megacast on their Facebook page. As we said, and as we all know, it is Election Day, and there has been so much talk about voter intimidation leading into today's election. As someone who's been voting since I was 18 and here in the state of Michigan for the last 15 years plus, I never remember there being so much focus on voter intimidation. And of course, one of the big things coming out of this was Secretary of State Benson mandating that guns not be allowed at the polling locations to help avoid any type of voter intimidation. And to talk more with us about that is Terry Johnson. He is an attorney and also the VP of Legal Operations for Firearms Legal Protection. Terry, thanks for being with us on the Oakland County Megacast. Ronnie, thank you. And to Tyler as well, always a pleasure. And uh, again, thanks for having me on. Uh, Terry, I was trying to do some research and I did not find any cases or definitely not any recent cases of this being an issue of people bringing guns to the polling locations. Are you aware of any? Am I missing something here? 
Well, when you say issues, I'm assuming you're you're referring to negative. Let me stop shaking my thing here. Uh, I'm assuming you're referring to negative issues, and no, there hasn't been. I mean, open carry uh, at the polls has been happening for even before you were voting back. Uh, you know. Uh, before you're 18, and it's never been an issue. However, I believe the Secretary of State and Attorney General are just trying to rally around something that just totally isn't there. And thank God the Court of Claims and the Court of Appeals agreed with us that this is just a issue that's just not there. It, well, and for a lot of these locations, like if I go into a school, I'm already that's already an area that guns are prohibited or churches where well, a lot of these polling locations would already have um, mandates in place outside of it, outside of it just being a polling location that guns aren't allowed. Well, sure, but here here's the issue and, and people don't truly understand firearms laws. So for example, while I can't conceal carry there, the only way I will actually be able to carry a firearm on those premises would be to open carry and that's assuming I have a concealed carry permit and once the government takes that building over for that time for uh, the purposes of elections it's no longer a school or a uh, church it is a actual government building so you are allowed to carry into those facilities um, as long as you are open carrying Oh, see, that's why we have people such as yourself on the show to educate us a little bit more. But with that, if it was happening, let's say it was at a school and there are kids still in that school, would you be allowed to carry then? Absolutely. I mean, police officers do it all the time. See a police officer get out of a police car, he or she is open carrying. And, you know, anybody who says, oh, my God, the kids are afraid. And it's like, I don't see them being afraid of police officers. Kids aren't, aren't taught to be afraid. Let me rephrase that. Kids aren't naturally afraid of an object. They're only taught to be afraid of an object. Tara Johnson with us on the Oakland County Megacast joining us today. So with that being the case, uh, where open carry, is per, open carry is permitted and voter intimidation is not something that we generally have seen as being a problem in the past or, or even currently necessarily, a problem either where is that line crossed so that those that are open carrying know what their limits are should they decide to open carry at the polls well it's not just the people who are open carrying firearms i mean voter intimidation comes in many forms i mean yes. someone pulls out a knife and they they utter the words you better vote the way i tell you to vote is that voter intimidation absolutely somebody pulls out um I don't know, a baseball bat and starts swinging it around and says the exact same words. Is that voter intimidation? Yes. So when we make these statements about, you know, what line do firearms owners have to cross? It's not just firearms owners. It is about everybody that goes into that polling place to vote. Voter intimidation is against the law, regardless if you use a, a gun, a two by four, a baseball bat or a knife. So the judge did strike down Benson's order banning the open carry at guns at the Michigan polling locations. It's now sitting with the Michigan Supreme Court. They have Correct. not made a decision yet, even though the U. Uh, you know Dana Nessel did request that they come back with a decision prior to today. What do you think the delay is, or or is it just one of those things where they're taking it based on their own schedule? Well, you know, it's the Supreme Court. We can't rush the Supreme Court. You know, when we filed um, this initially, and let, let's be fair in all of this, uh, Jocelyn Benson, the Secretary of State, filed it at the last minute. Had Jocelyn Benson followed the rules of the APA um, and gone down the, the proper route, this could have been talked about, dealt with, and potentially handled. Instead, they wait till the last minute and they use tactics like, you know, it's just really amazing to hear the attorney general talk about the governor was kidnapped and they use guns. We need to ban guns from voting places. Well, guess what? Or I'm sorry, attempted kidnapping. But here's the other part. They also use cars. So should we stop people from driving to the polls? It made absolutely no sense whatsoever. And what attempt, what allegedly happened to the governor uh, or was going to happen to the governor has no bearing on the uh, electorate as a whole. 
Terry Johnson with us here on the Oakland County Megacast. He is an attorney and the VP of Legal Operations for Firearms Legal Protection. And with that, Terry, I know that uh, you are very well educated in the firearms laws. In fact, I took a CPL class and you did the legal portion of that class. It's one of the ways I came to know you. I will say I took the class, but Terry, don't get mad at me. I never actually went and got my license, but I did sit through the class. Uh, okay. um, it, was, okay. it was really part of my education into the firearms industry. And knowing that, um, obviously the other big topic is about banning guns at the state capitol. Your thoughts on that? Well, you know, the, the funny thing is, I, I love how people make the argument, oh my God, they stormed the Capitol with guns. But if you go back and you look at the things that have been going on, not a single window was broken, not a single dollar's worth of damage happened when the um, armed protesters went up to Lansing. But let's look at some of the other protests that have taken place where guns haven't been. What do you see? You see people breaking out windows. You see people looting, you see people stealing. But yet again, just because someone has a different object in their hand, we want to crucify those who are carrying that. So people are carrying bricks. Should we ban bricks from the Capitol? Should we ban um, other things where people are breaking windows out? It just makes absolutely no sense what we're trying to do by trying to demonize an object what there are always two sides to every argument and you see both sides when it comes to firearms and one thing i learned while working for atf this is a very highly debatable issue on both sides of the aisle and because of that it makes it such a hot button topic where it seems like no clear-cut decisions are ever made the firearms laws between state and federal can be so gray. How is it that if someone is debating about whether or not purchasing their firearms or not, because sales are up right now prior to the election, and how do they, what is the best way for an individual to get educated on the laws? Because there is a lot of gray area. Well, there, there are, and you know, the, the best way is to do some research. Um, I, I would, you know, look at companies such as Firearms Legal Protection um, and some of the other companies that are out there who basically want to protect those people who are protecting themselves. Um, I would not get information from, uh, let's say, Google or my neighbor down the street or my local law enforcement officer. And it's nothing against law enforcement officers. They are they don't know the law the way attorneys and other folks do know the laws. Um, take a class, a, a concealed pistol license class. Um, there are ways to understand these, the, the laws that are out there. One of the big things though, you know, Ronnie, that, that really gets me when we talk about the firearms laws, if you ever notice people never wanna add to them, they always wanna take away. So when you come to the table to discuss, it's always one side that says, well, in order to move this forward, we got to take away this, take away that. But I never have ever seen us sit down and say, why don't we add some things to the firearms laws? It's, so it's always contentious from that standpoint, as you mentioned earlier. Terry Johnson here with us on the Oakland County Megacast. We're running a little bit behind, but before we let you go, anything that you want to talk about that maybe we didn't ask you about? You know, the, the main thing I, I really want to talk about, uh, just briefly, everybody looked at this gun ban that um, the Secretary of State and Attorney General put forward. The Court of Appeals, I'm sorry, the Court of Claims and the Court of Appeals, this really had nothing to do with firearms. This, again, was just an overreach of authority by the Secretary of State promoted by the Attorney General. And again, when you send a brief to the United, I'm sorry, to the Michigan Supreme Court, and you start citing polls, what people want in polls, we don't govern by polls, we govern by the law. And I would just ask our elected officials to make sure in the future as they promote things, let's just follow the law and what the law says. Yeah, I'm really surprised at some of the things that have happened, not only you know, uh, this mandate from the Secretary of State's office that was then overturned, but also the governor with her executive orders, which also got overturned. And, you know, I'm just surprised from the state of Michigan on that higher up level that they are not having more discussions 
when they do these things because they know they're going to be challenged in a court of law. And I believe it was Robert Davis that brought the suit against uh, the Benson's office on this one. Robert Davis is well known for his lawsuits. Uh, he's a former he, he Highland Park. He brought one and we brought one. Oh, you yes. brought one as well? And right. Michigan Open Carry and um, all the gun rights groups came together. Michigan Open Carry, Michigan Gun Owners, and Michigan Coalition for the Respons Coalition for Responsible Gun Owners. So we were part of that second suit. So, and with that, most people are asking, why do you need a gun to go vote? Why do you need a gun to go vote? Yeah, so, uh, you know, a lot of people are saying, when this first came out, it's like, well, why would you take a gun to go vote anyway? So, what's your response to people like that? Well, that's an interesting question. The question is, why wouldn't you? I mean, do you know when someone's going to attack you? I mean, let's think about what's going on. There's there's voter intimidation. There are people that are doing everything out here. And I think people also have a fundamental right to be safe. And if I can be safe by whether I have pepper spray, whether I have a knife, whether I have a firearm, why not? Why, I have a right to be safe. And you know what? When you need a police officer in the, in the moments ahead, they're only minutes away. Think about that. Terry Johnson with us here on the Oakland County Megacast. Thank you for being with us, taking time out of your schedule, as well as educating us on the firearms laws, because it can get uh, a little gray for so many of us. Um, and so we appreciate your time and your insight and your expertise. Thank you for having me on. And the uh, last thing I want to say is to everybody, please go vote today. Your vote does matter. We have definitely learned that, and in the state of Michigan as well. They say the road to the White House runs right through the state of Michigan, and I think that was evident as uh, President Trump was here last night rounding up his, uh, his campaign trail here in the state of Michigan. So everyone, take time to vote. A lot of people fought and died for your right to vote. Please honor them and their sacrifice by doing just that. Tyler and I are going to take a quick break here on the Oakland County Megacast. Still a lot to get to in the next half hour. Hi, I'm Dr. Faust, the medical director for the Oakland County Health Division. The most important thing you can do to prevent the spread of illness is to wash your hands thoroughly and often. Follow these six easy steps every time you wash your hands. Step one, turn on the sink and wet your hands with warm water. Step two, Apply soap to your hands and lather between your fingers, under your nails, and the front and back of your hands and wrists. Step three, wash your hands by scrubbing them together for at least 20 seconds. Step four, rinse your hands with warm, clean water. And step five, dry your hands with a clean cloth towel, a paper towel, or hot air blow dryer. If you're using a cloth towel, make sure to change it often. For handheld faucets, turn off the water using a paper towel instead of your bare hand. Step six, if you're using a paper towel, throw it away. Practice healthy habits like washing your hands after coughing or sneezing into them to keep you and others healthy. Go to oakgov.com health or call Nurse on Call at 1-800-848-5533 to learn more. Michigan, the coronavirus pandemic has put us all to the test. And now it's time to put COVID-19 to the test. As we move forward, testing will be critical. We encourage anyone who has reason to get tested to do so, those with symptoms and those without. If you are leaving home and going back to work, get tested. If you think you may have COVID-19 or you've been exposed recently through family, friends, or coworkers, get tested. Our test locator tool can help you find the right testing site that fits your needs. Even if you're looking for easy access with no cost, no prescription, and no appointment necessary, we've got you covered. Help Michigan move forward, not backward. To find a testing site or learn more, visit michigan.gov slash coronavirus test. A message from the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. Tuning in to the Oakland County Megacast. I'm Ronnie Dahl here in the studios alongside Tyler Keith. You can catch us on Civic Center TV, Birmingham Area Municipal Access, 
Channel 15 on Comcast, Channel 99 on AT&T. And if you're out driving around, 89.3 Lakes FM, 88.1 FM, The Biff. One of the areas hardest hit by this pandemic has been our senior citizens and those that are living in our long-term care facilities. It's been so hard to control the virus within the walls of some of these long-term care facilities. And the, you know, so many of them are doing whatever they can to try to keep the virus out and keep their uh, residents safe. With us to now on the Oakland County Megacast is Tracy Pokovnik. I knew I was a pro I knew I was going to get that wrong. I did. Pr- I did practice earlier. Uh, Edelstein, she's the director of residential marketing and community relations over at the Jewish Senior Life. Thank you for being with us here on the Oakland County Megacast. Thanks for having me today. How has this been for the juniors, Ju- Jewish Senior Life during the pandemic? And there have been so many changes to the health orders. How do you keep up with all of them? We are, um, you know, day to day. We have um, staff members totally dedicated to following the orders and all the directives from the state, from the government, from the Department of Health and Human Services, so that we are um, updating our residents and their families daily, sometimes hourly. Um, to make sure we are adhering to all of the guidelines. Uh, We are taking care of over 800 older adults on two campuses in independent living, assisted living, and memory care. We do not have a nursing home, which is considered a long-term care um, or skilled nursing, but we we do um, offer the other three levels of care. um, And so we are caring for many vulnerable older adults here. I worry so much about the seniors when it comes to that feeling of isolation. Are you allowed to um, let visitors back into the facilities right now? So um, all along, essential visitors were permitted, of course, with the proper screening tools in place. Um, As of um, just a few days ago, um, non-essential visitors are permitted in with um, also adhering to strict guidelines and um, limitations. Um, And prior to that, we had outdoor visits and window visits. So. we are um, our families are just as concerned as we are and not wanting to expose their loved ones to any outside possible exposures they may have had so we're seeing that um uh, residents are are you know really remaining relying heavily on the technology phones and um computers such as we are on today that is such a new way of life for all of us. With some of your senior um, residents, how has it been for them to have to try to master this technology? They've really stepped up to the challenge, and I think that they've kind of defied the odds of, you know, you can't teach someone um, new things as we age. Um, myself included, I was quite concerned. I had never been on a Zoom or on Teams or I barely used FaceTime and I'm not in that age bracket yet. And um, seeing the residents um, really um, engage in this new technology for them and really um, embrace it. And it's a feeling of accomplishment um, for them as well. Uh, Tracy Prokovnik Edelstein with us. She is the Director of Residential Marketing and Community Relations at Jewish Senior Life. And Tracy, at this moment in time, We're seeing a spike in COVID-19 positive cases in the state of Michigan. How is that impacting how your clients are being able to be visited by family and by loved loved ones? And and how are you helping them to navigate that as we were in a place previously where we were starting to come out from under those restrictions because the state's COVID-19 positive levels were looking much better and now we're heading back into a direction where it's a little more bleak. Right, and, and it can be confusing, and that's why we have a dedicated um, staff team here just to um, um, learn about the new regulations as they change sometimes in the same day. Um, as, as you may have learned last week, um, they opened up um, in-person dining and more group, small group activities and senior communities, and then the next day we heard that, that the cases have gone up tremendously in our county. Um, so it's education. It's reminding our residents through letters, 
through something called Voice Friend, which is a voice messaging system that goes to them and their families um, with reminders of how to stay safe. Um, you cannot restrict older adults from leaving the community. Uh, again, we're not a nursing home, so we don't fall under that umbrella. And so we're just reminding them that if they do choose to leave, that they are exposing themselves and perhaps other people to possible uh, risks. And so with our older adult population, we know that um, based on the statistics we've seen, they are really in the most vulnerable of groups. And so um, I will tell you that our residents um, are telling us that they want to stay healthy, they want to remain safe, and they are they have adapted to this new way of living, which hopefully won't go on too much longer, but who knows, um, in a way that I can only um, just admire from afar because they are strong, they are resilient, and um, you know, they have, many of them have been through things like World War II, um, the Depression, um, things in their lives that have been uh, harder than this, but now they're older and some don't feel well. So it's that added layer of um, facing another challenge head on. Technology has definitely helped all of us survive this crisis and the pandemic. And it continues to change. And so we now have like Alexa and Google Assist. And they've taken it a step further where some of them now have cameras as well. So you can just directly communicate with one another. Are you allowing those type of devices within your facilities? Oh, we definitely are. Um, we, we also um, check on our residents every day. They get phone calls from us, um, from staff members. Again, we have a whole team of staff that just make assurance calls. We also have a lifeline button that all of our residents have uh, so that it, they will press it if there's an, an emergent need, um, as well as a door tag program so that in the morning at a certain time and at night at a certain time, the residents put out and take in almost like a hotel card that says do not disturb. It tells us that they're in for the night um, and that they've got awoken in the morning. So when we do our what we call rounds where we walk the halls, if, if a tag is on or off at the inappropriate time, we do another assurance check. So between that and the devices that you mentioned, um, we have residents who are doing crossword puzzles together, who are playing Mahjong virtually. Um, and when I say crossword puzzles together, I mean on the phone. Um, we, we are um, doing everything possible to keep that socialization going. And um, we have something called Touchtown, which is um, a television a system through the television where we can um, put on different shows and movies and some, some of the group activities that we were not able to do for such a long time, we're able to kind of pipe through each resident's apartment um, specifically. We even do exercise over the loudspeaker um, and I can do that for, in my office too while I'm listening. So we've all had to get creative during this time. What do you think has been one of the benefits coming out of this crisis and that you'll maybe continue post pandemic? Well, I, th I think we've really learned how to um, manage in a crisis differently um you know we've all thought we've been in crises in our lives um and i think this this has shown us that perhaps um this is the biggest one yet and that we can um come out on top on the other side and and be okay and and adapt and and be kind to each other and be more patient and i'll tell you we certainly have mastered a cleanliness and um sanitation uh, um Sanitization, I part perhaps, excuse me, sanitization, and kind of all the things that um, increase safety and wellness um, with our residents. Yeah, and the good thing is now you're able to find those supplies a little bit easier than back in the beginning because uh, things were pretty scarce uh, when the, all of this first broke out. Um, and with that, what what are you doing to help? Um, keep the virus out of your facilities and have you had any outbreaks and how have you managed to contain it? We have had minimal cases throughout COVID. Um, and um, if if we do identify that someone is positive, then we follow the, the quarantine um, self isolation programs and protocols mandated by the state. Of course, we report them to the state as well and do the contact tracing. Uh, we've kept it to a minimal one case here or there. You know, I think it's really unrealistic for for anyone to assume that it's not going to happen in any type of communal setting when people are permitted to come and go. Um, again, the state, you know, we cannot restrict people from leaving. And so um, 
with those choices some make, um, again, it's increasing the risk. But we have not seen any type of spread. Um, and uh, as of late, I don't know of any positive cases in our communities. That's great to hear. Let's knock on wood and make sure, you know, hope that yeah. it stays that way as well. Because right. when you hear about the, the new surge in the state of Michigan, I'm sure sometimes that can send a panic through you and your residents as well. Uh, today is election day. How has that been going um, for your residents? Have many of them been able to vote or do they go to the polls or did a lot of them, them take advantage of the absentee voting this year? Well, we're really fortunate here in West Bloomfield with our clerk, Debbie Binder. Um, prior to COVID in January and February, she came to the communities and educated our residents on how the different options to vote. Many chose the absentee ballot um, option. So the good news is that was already in process for many of our residents. And what we did um, over the last two weeks is we um, took our residents individually. We have um, uh, vehicles at Jewish Senior Life and we have um, uh, drivers here and they took residents one by one to the clerk's office both here in West Bloomfield and our and on our Oak Park campus to drop off their ballots um, and our residents felt really good about this um, they're civic minded they felt it was their civic duty and they also have their own um, opinions just like all the other generations as to who should be our next commander in chief how has it been with all that you and your teammates are doing to try to keep your residents engaged and um, connected with one another? Are you concerned about isolation as this pandemic continues on? It's a great question because, you know, we know winter is coming and we know that's a typical isolative time for older adults in general and, and what we're we're telling people in particular people who are considering moving right now is that you know spending another winter in your home alone um is is likely to be more challenging than at least being in a communal setting because in a communal setting we have um check-in systems we have socialization options you know all of us in senior communities have figured out ways to make socialization happen at this point um if that's what a resident wants and we also um you know, we can do in-person dining right now. We can do small group activities right now. That could change tomorrow, um, but then it could change back. So we feel like, you know, we're still offering, able to offer more than we were six, even six months ago and um, have figured out different ways. We have um, uh, activity cards where we come around with crossword puzzles and books and movies and um, mind jogging games. So. You know, we, we just, we are doing everything possible for our residents to make sure that that they are going to get through this, both socially and emotionally. And, you know, in thinking about that, I'm sure there are some families out there that have been considering putting their loved ones in a facility such as yours. It's one of the hardest decisions you have to make, yet maybe they've been holding off because of the COVID crisis. What do you want them to know? And when do you make that decision as to when you leave them, you know, let your loved ones stay at home or in their own home or when to put them in a residential facility? It really is the million dollar question and it's so difficult. You know, I talk to families daily about this challenge and what I, I often encourage them to do is to make sure that their loved one is a part of the conversation and that it's generally not going to happen overnight. So start with conversations about, you know, if they were to move, what would their choices be? And, and really respect their wishes and, and don't push too hard because when you push hard, they're gonna pull away. Uh, because as we get older and we lose control, over the things in our lives that we once could do very successfully, driving, working, um, being healthy. You know, those things are changing in some way for our older adults and, and we need to make sure they have as much control as possible in these later years. Um, and, and, and kind of what I said before, I, I am you know, saying to people, you know, winter's coming. It's never fabulous in, in Michigan. Um, we don't have, um, you know, the, the, the warmest of winters around here. So being isolated in the winter and then isolated in the winter with COVID, um, you know, may want to think about moving to a community because communities in general, we've really figured out how to stay clean, how to stay safe, 
we know what to do. We have protocols in place. Um, we're being monitored by the state. So we know, you know, we all know that we're in compliance and it really is the safest place to be right now. Yeah, sometimes, um, you know, when you have an elderly person and maybe they've lived in their same home for 50, 60 years, trying to get them to move and to convince them to leave is so hard. So it's a lot of tough conversations for families to have. But at the end of the day, you want to do what is the safest route for your loved ones. So um, it's great that you have your facilities there to provide an option for those family members uh, that, you know, it is time for them to maybe, especially the ones that are living on their own still, it is time for them to make that decision to put them in a residential facility. So uh, thank you for what you and your teammates do over there. Quickly before I let you go, though, uh, we've heard so much about um, the lack of trying to getting enough employees to work at some of the residential facilities. How are you guys on employees and are you hiring at all? Um, that's a great question. We have been very minimally impacted by that. Um, one of the things we're really proud of Jewish Senior Life is we have staff in all departments that have been with us 10, 15, 20 years from personal caregivers to maintenance departments to myself um, to executive level staff. So um, it's not something that we, um, wasn't one of our big challenges during this, this time, um, but hiring in general is a challenge because one of the services we offer is care. and being a caregiver is the hardest job that um, um, I will I will just say it. It is the hardest job I've ever seen, and um, uh, it's it's not easy because it's an it's a, it's easy to burn out, and it's not the best um, as far as um, payment. People you know are looking to be very competitive in the, in the market, and so there are other places trying to um, you know get staff as well. So it, it can be a challenge. We're fortunate right now it's not for us. And I, I think it's a testament to how we treat our staff and how we feel uh, our staff feels like family, part of the team here. Well, they are definitely, the healthcare workers are some of the heroes, not just in the middle of a pandemic, but outside of the crisis as well. But I think one thing this pandemic has helped to is to let the public really understand and realize just um, how important they are to um, our community and to keeping our loved ones safe. So thank you so much for being with us here on the Oakland County Megacast. Thank you so much for having me today. It was a pleasure. Tracy Prokovnik with us, Edelstein. She is the Director of Residential Marketing and Community Relations for Jewish Senior Life. We appreciate your time on the Oakland County Megacast and say thank you to your entire team over there for all of the hard work that they are doing to keep our seniors safe take a quick break here on the Oakland County Megacast. Michigan, we still need to stay careful because we don't want to go backwards, back to where we started. So keep standing six feet apart, keep wearing a mask in public, and if you have symptoms, talk to a healthcare provider about getting tested. To move forward, let's all do our part. So stay careful michigan.gov slash coronavirus. Michigan, we're calling on you to save lives. Don't ignore it. Don't let it go to voicemail. It's urgent. In fact, it's critical. Because if you've been in close contact with someone who tests positive for COVID-19, you may have been exposed to the virus. And you could get a call from My COVID Help or your local health department. So please answer the call to learn how to protect yourself, your family, and friends. We're calling on you to stop the spread of COVID-19, to make it safe to reopen businesses and help Michigan move forward. So if you get a call from My COVID Help or your local health department, you may have been exposed to someone with COVID-19. To protect us all, answer the call. Learn more at michigan.gov slash contain COVID. A message from the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. It's great to have you with us on the Tuesday edition of the Oakland County Megacast. It's election day. 
And the polls open at 7 a.m. this morning. We are hearing that there are quite a few long lines at a lot of the polling locations. But the good news with that, the weather is nice. So it's a good day to be able to stand outside. And plus, I think the lines may seem longer than what they are just because people are adhering to that six-foot distance rule for COVID-19. So maybe before they wouldn't have seemed as long, but now just because of that rule, they are a little bit longer. Yeah, it might be the case. Uh, that being said, these uh, the election workers are doing their best to move those lines forward efficiently, and, and people are doing their best to vote as quickly as they po possibly can, but take their time as well. So if you're able to stand in, in line for a little bit and just be patient, be prepared, maybe bring an extra layer of clothes, some food or something to, to, to drink while you're waiting in line, always a good idea to be prepared as you go to the polls today. I think from my neighborhood app, it looks like the line's about 20, 25 minutes in Kegel yeah. Harbor. But uh, as the day goes on, if you pick those off times to vote, what I also do prior to going in to um, cast my ballot, what I like to do is um, print off the sample ballot. And then I pretty much have everyone picked out. So when yeah. I get in there, it's just boom, and I can be in and out in five minutes. Yeah, that's what I do, too. I do all my research beforehand. I go off the reach of the races that are going to be on my particular ballot in each election. I have those selections either in a, an, in a list of position and then candidate that I'm, that I'm voting for or in sample ballot form. And, yeah, it makes it a lot easier. You can go in there, just make sure that you check off the right people, you fill in the you fill in the boxes correctly with a black or blue, blue pen, which may be provided to you at some polling location, but you might have to bring your own too, just in case, and you'll be good to go. So um, we, our last guest that we were going to have on today, uh, unfortunately, we had a scheduled mix up. So we will actually try to get um, the owner of Big Dip Burgers over in Wild Lake on next week. So just a little bit of a schedule a snafu there, but you know, that's to be expected. Yeah. Jake's books about 30 guests each and every week. He does a great job he at does. it too. Um, when I look he at does. some of the people he's able to get in organizations, because we do try to bring you information and interviews from people from all different walks of life and different entities as well. So he does a great job with that. So uh, we'll try to get you him next week. But in the meantime, let's just go over the headlines one more time before we let you go on this Tuesday. Uh, still a lot of confusion in the restaurant world because under the new pandemic orders that took effect yesterday for Michigan restaurants, customers are required to provide their names and phone numbers as part of their dining experience. The mandate is intended to help limit the spread of COVID-19, but the lack of information from the state on how that information is to be collected has the restaurant industry calling for more details expectations for how to gather the information and what should be done with it are unclear according to the ceo for the michigan restaurant and lodging association also a concern is a restaurant owner's liability if the personal details provided to the restaurant are shared other questions include whether every person at the table must provide contact information whether minors are included, and whether a restaurant faces a penalty if false or incomplete information is given. State Health Department says it is finalizing guidance for restaurants, but didn't say why that didn't happen before the rules took effect. So a lot of questions in that area as well. Also making headlines this morning on civiccentertv.com. Uh, coronavirus outbreaks continue at Michigan schools and colleges. More than 6,000 students and staff have been infected by coronavirus and new and ongoing school-related outbreaks, according to data released Monday by the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. That includes 606 students and staff at outbreaks in 126 schools serving preschoolers through high school. But really, the bulk of the cases, no surprise here, continue around the 28 college campuses. There are uh, a reported 5,409 uh, outbreaks um, at the college campuses. Now, in the case of K-12 through outbreaks, it only reflects people who were infected at school or during a school-related activity, such as sports. College numbers include students infected at parties and other off-campus activities not sponsored by the school. The state's report reflects numbers collected on Thursday, October 
Octo October 29th. And uh, just a reminder, a COVID-19 outbreak is defined as two or more cases with a link by place and time indicating a shared exposure outside of a household. Not to, I mean, I don't think this is surprising, but what is happening, some schools are now deciding to go back to remote learning and not necessarily directed to uh, their individual schools, but also the uptick in cases throughout the community as well. Yeah, they're doing it out of caution initially and because of, of course, Oakland County coming out and putting uh, and, and telling these schools that we're in an area of, of high risk with recent cases of COVID of COVID nineteen, and you know also you have in, you have these school districts where they have staff and faculty, and they have students and f and their families that have been exposed or or are COVID nineteen positive, didn't necessarily get exposed or or test positive due to a school function, but you know taking those precautions because these people are in the classroom and these people are going to be around students and around faculty and around staff and keeping them safe is of course going to be paramount to these school organizations so uh, West Bloom that was of course the reason why West Bloomfield decided that their school did, that they were going to return to entirely being on their Laker online distance learning program and why some other schools are making similar decisions as time goes on. Knowing all that I thought it was a little bit surprising that the emergency stay in place order that was issued for the University of Michigan students hasn't been extended. It expired this morning at 7 a.m. That was the um, original schedule. And the COVID-19 cases associated with the U of M has decreased. Uh, the reduction in new university associate associated cases has allowed case investigators and contact tracers to catch up. That's according to the health officials in a release. Overall, the number of cases in Washtenaw County remain high and weekly test positivity has increased to nearly 4%. When the stay in place order was issued two weeks ago, more than 60% of Washtenaw County cases were associated with U of M students. Case investigators and contact tracers were unable to keep up with the sharp increase in the cases. Uh, student cases now represent about one-third of the local, local COVID-19 cases there at the University of Michigan campus. And I would think, too, one thing, they want the students be, to be able to vote yeah. because there are a lot of University of Michigan students that are from, if not right there in Ann Arbor, but from the state of Mich Michigan in which they'd be close enough to, to drive home and vote if they wanted to. Yeah, I think that's one of the reasons why they did let this expire this morning is, you know, maybe it's the situation where it expired today, they let it go for today, and then they put another order that's exactly the same or very similar in place tomorrow and can and essentially just give a one-day moratorium on it. That's a possibility, or it's, or it's a situation where it, it's been effective in curbing the numbers at the University of Michigan. They're going to give the students another chance to perform their duty to the community properly and take their social distancing seriously, wear their masks, avoid going to these large gatherings where they're not following those guidelines and see if it works, or which may, of course, lead potentially down the line if there is another serious case of outbreaks on the university campus due to out-of-school functions that we could see similar policies come back into place or even the University of Michigan be be forced to make a decision to go entirely virtual going forward. Also making news over on CivicCenterTV.com, an Oakland County clinic is now offering rapid COVID-19 tests to employers and academic institutions. Berkeley Urgent Care has the federally approved Podell Sophia 2 test, which provides results in 15 minutes. The cost, $100 per person. And the test, which is not covered by insurance, is available by appointment or walk-in at the clinic. That's over on Greenfield Road in the city of Berkeley. It's really designed for people that are asymptomatic patients. Maybe you need clearance for work, school, or a medical procedure. The antigen test delivers a highly accurate positive result and gives patients results within minutes. Rather than waiting days for results with prior tests, the testing comes as coronavirus cases surge in the state. On Monday, Michigan added 6,709 new cases and 17 more deaths. That included a daily average of 3,354 cases per day 
from Sunday to Monday. The surge in cases, not surprising though. We had right. been talking about this and anticipating it for quite some time. What's going to be interesting though, if this does continue once the election is over, is the governor going to move us back to phase three? Yeah, and, and is that going to be and is that going to be enforceable too? Is another question because her order her, that was something the My Safe Start plan was something that was enacted under her executive orders, or or while they were in place, there could be some question with that. But I wouldn't be surprised if we were, are phased back because the positivity rate with these with these case numbers is increasing over time with the cases. We're doing a lot more testing, so yes, we're going to have higher numbers over time but it's the rate of positive cases as a result of those tests that we're doing that, that is of concern. And we expected there to be a spike in the, fall, in the fall or into the winter months as weather got colder and people went back inside and maybe they weren't as careful as they previously were uh, because they were outside so often with friends and with family. And we're, seeing this, we're definitely seeing the spike and if that doesn't go away or it isn't mitigated relatively soon, we could potentially see an Im- see impacts in our daily life from the state government down like we saw earlier on, earlier on in the pandemic in order to quickly curb surging rates. Yeah, and I wonder, um, typically when we've seen a spike in cases, it's followed a holiday, yeah. such as the 4th of July, Memorial Day, Labor Day. We've not had those holidays and we're seeing this huge spike. So you wonder what's going to happen after Halloween. And what's going to happen after after Election Day. So I, th- I think really two weeks from now is going to be that next benchmark where we look and see where has our progress truly gone as we go over time and we see you know, every person's three to five day period to be able to test positive if they're exposed uh, uh, on the early end or through their 14 day incubation period to show symptoms or, t- or test positive. That's something that we're definitely going to want to be keeping an eye on as we get further into the month because by that time we're going to be in the thick of families making plans for the Thanksgiving holiday people gathering for that holiday and just before potentially and uh, and other gatherings continue on such as high school football and other sports Uh, and, and then there's of course those schools that do remain in person over that time and and how a change in COVID-19 numbers locally and statewide could impact that. Yeah, and so uh, as far as the West Bloomfield School District goes, while they are going back to remote learning, their sports are continuing. So high school football is continuing and they're going to wait and see if they have to make some adjustments and some changes going into the winter season. Yeah, and that I would think is something that's going to be discussed, and maybe there should be some word on that, hopefully, I would think, in the next few days from the MHSAA as we're quickly approaching the beginning of those seasons and the tryout periods for those teams, whereas fall sports still have a few more weeks left to wrap up. Uh, High school football in particular doesn't wrap up state championships uh, are on December 4th and December 5th with the semifinals being on the weekend, the Friday and the Saturday after Thanksgiving. So still plenty of time left with those. And, and as far as West Bloomfield goes, they have said they're going to follow, at least Deanna Barish, when we spoke to her yesterday, the assistant superintendent for curriculum assessment and instruction with the, with the district said they're going to continue sports as normal unless there's a decision made from the MHSAA, particularly for, for fall sports. So there will be football on Friday. We will broadcast that on Friday as West Bloomfield moves into the district semifinal against the uh, against Troy Athens uh, and then uh, against Troy and then moves on potentially from there. So still plenty of developments left with uh, coronavirus in our local area as we're seeing these cases spike. And just a reminder as well, if you head over to civiccentertv.com, click on the coronavirus tab. There you'll find links to various uh, resources for you to be able to keep up to date yourself when it comes to all things related to the coronavirus. If you go over to the state of Michigan and it will take you directly to this page where you can, if you have any type of questions about COVID-19, that's where you will click on, including the latest orders coming out of the Department of Health and Human Services. And you can also find information regarding the outbreaks and tracking exactly 
where those outbreaks take place as well. So we like to provide you that information, uh, make it quick and easy for you to do your own homework during the coronavirus crisis because there's so much information coming at us. You don't know what to believe, what not to believe. I always like to look at the numbers myself. So that's a good place that you can go to to get all the resources. We're going to take a quick break here on the Oakland County Megacast. Hi, my name is Kurt Lawson, and I'm the Public Information Officer for West Bloomfield Township. We wanted to reach out to you, our older adults, to provide information that you may find useful during this difficult time. We want to ensure you that West Bloomfield Town Hall our Waters and Utility Department, West Bloomfield Parks, and our Police and Fire Departments continue to work hard on your behalf. Information and resources can be found on the Township website, the Police Facebook and Twitter, or call West Bloomfield Parks COVID-19 Help Hotline. Please remember to keep your social distance of at least six feet, wear facial coverings when you leave your home, and wash your hands for at least 20 seconds with soap. These precautions will help keep you safe during these difficult times. This may seem uncomfortable, but so is being hooked to an IV, sleeping in a hospital bed, and fighting for your life. When it comes to COVID-19, comfort is not as important as saving lives. Wearing a mask can greatly reduce the chance of spreading the virus. So mask up, Michigan, every time you leave home. Election is well underway here in the state of Michigan. Uh, we are seeing that there are lines at the area polling locations, although they're not terribly long here in the greater West Bloomfield area. Just have a little patience as you get out to vote today, but it's already been a record turnout for the state of Michigan because they do, do say the road to the White House runs straight through Michigan. Yeah, and this is gonna be a state that everybody nationally is gonna have their eyes on as time goes on through tonight, through the remainder of the week. Jocelyn Benson, the Secretary of State, has already said several times over the la last couple of weeks that she expects doesn't expect results to come from the state of Michigan, particularly for the presidential election. And I would also say probably for the senatorial position as well in that race between the incumbent Democrat Gary Peters and Republican challenger John James uh, until upwards of Friday this week. So I wouldn't be surprised with that. But tomorrow we will have some results. We do expect that, we, that we'll have results from some of our local, com local elections in the four communities from West Bloomfield Township and the cities of Kinko Harbor. Orchard Lake and Sylvan Lake, maybe even some county positions as well as, as the county clerk's office and local clerks all throughout Oakland County work very hard throughout the day and throughout the night to tally those votes and make sure that they are counted properly. Uh, their phones probably ring in just as often as ours are right now. We will have that full election special for you tomorrow on the megacast we'll speak to candidates that have won those positions after those races are called by oakland county on their results page we won't have live coverage tonight we will however post on our home page on civiccentertv.com the full listing of result of results from oakland county so you'll be able to go to our website civiccentertv.com we'll have a slider at the top of the page you'll click that and it will take you directly to the results page on Oakland County where we're getting our information from. It is open to the public and we will have full coverage for you as results are coming in tomorrow. We'll speak to some candidates from the four communities. We'll speak to the clerks as well. We'll try to get mo as many of them on as possible, possibly even Oakland County Clerk Lisa Brown on the show as well to talk about how the progress of counting the votes has gone in this election with the influx of absentee votes and with those voting in person as well. That coming up tomorrow on our entire our entire show based around elections in our four communities in the local area. So I have been watching uh, social media as well as following the uh, Michigan Attorney General as well as the Secretary of State's page. And so far, it seems like things are going pretty well. Yes. Although in the city of Flint, there have been reports that an unknown party is spreading misinformation via robocalls. 
uh, in an attempt to confuse the voters. They're basically saying, um, do not go out and vote. The lines are long that you can vote tomorrow. That obviously is not true. False. Right. The polls close at 8 p.m. tonight. So um, you just be informed as you go out. Don't listen to the robocalls, and I'm sure that will be investigated once the day is over. Yeah, that is a, that is a felony, providing misinformation on, on the election. And, and if you are receiving false information, I believe you are, definitely reach out to your local clerk. Uh, you can send the tip into the Attorney General's office, and, and your calls will be answered on that. Thank you for tuning in to the Tuesday edition of the Oakland County Megacast. We'll be back here tomorrow at 10 a.m.